Okay, I want to jump into our message now today. And today's message I've entitled, Five Ways to Pray for Your Children and Grandchildren. But actually, I put in parentheses on my message notes, it's actually five ways you can pray for anybody. Okay, so this is five ways you can pray for anybody, especially I think it's help, going to be helpful for your family. Because I don't know about you, But for me, anxiety and worry for my family began the moment that the pregnancy test that Summer took came back and it had the two lines on it, right? She showed me the thing, and I'm like, what's two lines? Why don't they make that thing easier to read? It's got two lines, and apparently that means that you're positive, you're pregnant. And so immediately that worry sets in. Are we really pregnant? Are we going to be good parents? What if this pregnancy doesn't go well? What if the baby isn't healthy? And then as the baby is born, you think, well, now the worry's going to get a little better, right? (laughs) So then, and now they're born, and you have to bring them home. They make you bring them home from the hospital, right? And then you're wondering, is this breathing normal? Are they developing properly? Are they on the right track? Is that normal? Is that right? Should it be that color? And you just don't know anything. And then it gets worse because you send them to school. And then you wonder... Are they going to get bullied? Are they safe? What is the teacher teaching them? What kind of friends do they have? What's life going to be like? And then next, I'm not ready for this. Next, I've watched this up close as a youth leader. Next, they go through puberty. I've been leading Celebrate Recovery long enough to know that just because your kids get older and grow up, even leave the house, that doesn't mean that we stop worrying about our kids. In fact, it seems like at every single life milestone, our worry for our kids is just increasing. And the truth is, we have a laundry list of stuff that we're worried about, right? I mean, we love our kids. I get it. I want nothing more than to see my kids thrive. I want nothing more than to see them live life to the full. But I know in this world, there's a lot of stuff out there. I know there's dangers. I know there's trappings. I know how hard life can be. And if we're honest in this room, all of us carry scars and baggage and hurt from our past that we want to shield our kids from, right? We want to protect them from going through things we went through. And our grandkids, we don't want them to step on some of the same landmines we stepped on. So we do everything in our power to shield them and to protect them, and we worry. But actually, the Bible spells out that there's a remedy for this. There's actually something that we can do with our worry. There's actually a way that we can use our worry as an indicator to drive us towards doing something that will actually help, because Jesus is really clear. When it comes to worry, it doesn't help us at all. It doesn't add anything to the situation. How many of you have worried day and night about something that ended up not happening, right? And so we have to really guard against this thing of worry. So Paul tells us, here's the antidote, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He's done. Then you will experience God's peace. Now, if I were to ask the room today, take a little poll, how many of you would say you would like to and you would like your kids and grandkids and family to experience God's peace? Okay, so some of you want your family to be in anarchy. I get it, right? But we all want our families to experience God's peace. Well, this liter- uh, this is so good, we got to read it out loud, okay? We're going to read this together out loud. Remember, a comma means a pause, and a period means a stop. And so we're going to read this together out loud. We'll start with don't. Here we go. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He has done. Then you will experience God's peace. Amen. It's so practical. It's so straightforward. And it comes, I believe, it's really the key of what we need to do with our worry. Because the reality is, friends, we have stuff we worry about. And so I want us, when we worry, for that to stop right in that moment. Okay, I'm worrying right now, so what do I need to do? I need to pray. But what should I pray? Well, I want to look at one of Paul's prayer 
from the Bible, from the book of Colossians. This is a prayer Paul prayed for the church in Colossae, and I want us to learn how we can use this prayer as a roadmap that we can actually use for praying for our kids. Okay, so that's what we're going to be doing today, because I believe that faithful intercessory prayer will radically help and transform the lives of your children and grandchildren. If we want to have our kids and our families live out God's dream for their lives, then they are going to need intercessors in their family who are praying the will of God over them. I mean, if I were just to say, how many of you in this room are here today because you had a grandma or a mom or a dad or an aunt or an uncle that would not give up on you in prayer? And I just believe with all my heart that this is, as parents, as uh, Christians, this is the real gift that we can give to our kids and our grandkids. For generations down the line, the effect of a praying member of your family. So I can hear some of you already that groan inside, oh, Kurt, I stink at prayer. Prayer is so hard. The Bible says prayer is hard, right? Prayer is so hard. But this quote I've shared with you before, but it's too good not to bring back. Max Cicado said it like this. Our prayers may be awkward. Our attempts may be feeble. But since the power of prayer is in the one who hears it and not in the one who says it, our prayers do make a difference. It doesn't matter how feeble it doesn't matter how simple. Do you remember the story in the Bible of the Pharisee and the tax collector that go into the temple to pray? The Pharisee goes up in front. Jesus is telling the story and the Pharisee prays this beautiful prayer. Beautiful. Oh, thank you. I'm not like all these other people. And then the tax collector with his head bowed says, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And Jesus says, which one left the temple that day having been justified, having been heard by God? Well, it was the one that was honest, okay? The one that was honest. So here's what I want to give you today. These practical steps, a roadmap for you to pray. So let's just start right at the top of this prayer. Point number one, if you're a note taker, you can write this one down in your app or there in your note sheet that's in your bulletin. Point one is this. Pray that they will be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Verse nine says it like this. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. You see, every believer desperately needs to have the knowledge of his will. The Greek word that's translated here, knowledge, actually carries this idea of full knowledge, accurate knowledge. You see, I understand that there are ways and, and about God that you and I will never grasp. I understand that we're never going to uh, reach the end goal of knowing everything about God on this side of heaven. But I don't want that to then lead us to believe that we can't know God's will for our life. That we don't need to learn anything more about it. See, God wants us to know His will. God wants us to understand His dream for our life. Ephesians 5.17 says, Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Understand what the Lord wants to do. Listen, this is important that you know this about God. He's not a distant dictator who just issues orders and tells you blindly to obey, blindly to follow. He's not some kind of father who just says, because I said so. That's not how God treats us. In fact, we know that by reading what Jesus had to say in John 15, 13 through 15. Jesus said it like this. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. And I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You see, as we study God's Word, and as we discover these wonderful truths that God has placed for us in His Word, that His Spirit brings alive in us, we are growing in our knowledge of His will. So let's pray this for our family. Pray for your children. Pray for your grandchildren. Pray that they would, would grow and know 
God's perfect dream for their life. Pray that they would understand what God wants to do for them. When I ask people, what's God's desire for your life? So many people answer back, I'm not sure, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what God's will for my life. I, I don't know. As if it's some kind of mysterious and secret and hidden away thing. Friends, God reveals to us his desire and purpose for our life through his word. And I'm not just talking about a head knowledge. I'm not just talking about me being able to recite scripture or me knowing the answers to the theological, deep, doctrinal questions people might ask. I'm talking about actually knowing Jesus. You see, one of the things we do even in the church is we can start to define knowledge a lot like the world defines knowledge instead of this truly, uniquely beautiful thing that is Christian knowledge. You see, knowledge in the world, knowledge in the secular world, here I'll just read to you the Oxford Dictionary definition of knowledge. Facts, information, and skills acquired by a person through experience or education. The theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. But see, this is way different than Christian knowledge. This is way different from Christian knowledge because Christian knowledge is about knowing a person, not just facts about a person. See, let me explain to that. I love my wife, and I want to know her. Not read a book about her interests, I want to know what face she makes when she smiles, when she's aggravated, when she's ready to leave the room. I want to know her laugh. I want to know her smell. I want to experience life with her. I want more than just to know that she likes this or doesn't like this. Does that make sense? But so many of us have exchanged knowing Jesus with information about Jesus. And those things are very, very different. The only way you can know somebody is to spend quality time with them. The more time you spend with somebody, the more you begin to know them. The more intimate time spent. This is what God wants for each of us, that we would know his son. Remember the Old Testament, Adam knew his wife and she conceived a child, right? That's not talking actually strictly sexually. It's talking about a deep, level of knowing and intimacy that existed between them. That's what God wants for us to have, to know him. So let's pray that for our kids. Let's pray that for our grandkids. God, I pray that they would know you, that they would have an intimate relationship with you, that they would know your will for their life. See, I'm afraid we grow far too comfortable with information instead of intimate relationship. Here's number two. So pray that they know God, his will for their life, that they grow in knowledge. And number two is pray that they will live lives pleasing to the Lord. Pray that they will live lives pleasing to the Lord. Verse 10, the first part of it says, then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. You know what pleases the Lord? It's not brilliance. It's not wealth. It's not prosperity, it's not popularity, it's not beauty. It's an intimate relationship of knowing that leads to an obedient life that pleases the Lord. 1 John 3.22 says it like this, And we will receive whatever we request because we obey Him and do the things that please Him. See, who here, who here, this is another survey of the room, who here does not want their children or grandchildren to live a Christ-like life that's obedient to God, that pleases the Lord? Anyone? I want them to please themselves, Kurt. No, you want them to please the Lord. But we have to remember, friends, how do we please the Lord? What does the Bible teach us is the only possible way for us to live a life pleasing to the Lord? Hebrews eleven six 6 says it like this without faith, and it's impossible to please God without faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. It means that the only way, it's not about the stuff we do, as if our good works were somehow so good that God in heaven would see them and be impressed by our activity. The Bible says that without faith, our works are like filthy rags in comparison 
to the Lord. We can't please God by our working. The way we please God is by our relationship, by faith in Jesus Christ. But here's the good news. The radical good news of how this all works. Because you might be hearing me and thinking, man, having and please the Lord, this sounds a lot like works. Well, here's the good news. Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. Here's the good news of the gospel. Now, may the God of peace, who brought, who brought up from the dead our Lord, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all that you need for doing his will. Now listen close. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. So according to this, who is it that equips us to live a life pleasing to the Lord? This isn't something you do in your own strength. It's not something you can do in your own power. And neither can your kids or their grandkids. Okay, if they want to live a life pleasing to the Lord, it's by faith. And then by faith, God begins through Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit, to empower us to actually live a life pleasing for the Lord. He's the engine behind all of it. He's the one making it all happen in and through us. This is good news, friends. So do you want your kids and grandkids and family to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord? Then I would encourage you. We have a way of praying in our Western culture that I call our Western medicine mindset when it comes to prayer. What I mean by that is we like to pray about the symptoms God changed this behavior. God changed this behavior. God changed this behavior. Oh, this symptom. Changed this symptom. But the problem is we are only looking at the symptoms and not the root cause of the problem. Do you want to see your grandkids and your kids and your family actually transform? Then we have to pray at what's at the root. What's at the root is they need to have a knowing, intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. By faith, he's pouring into them the Holy Spirit. And by the power of the Spirit, they're able to live lives pleasing of the Lord. Does that make sense? See, instead of just praying, God, make them stop doing that bad thing, we're saying, God, help them to know you. Really, genuinely know you. More than anything, God, that's my desire. I want them to know you. I want them to know you, and I want them to grow in their knowledge of you, and I want your spirit to fill them in such a way, God, that they live lives pleasing of the Lord. John 8, 31 through 32. Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So what did Jesus, now this is, again, we talk about this verse a lot because every, so many of our universities have this verse, the truth will set you free over the doorways of their institution, right? But that's not what it says. It doesn't just say truth will set you free as if you learn some science and some math and you'll be free. It says, if you know my teaching and obey it, then you'll be my disciple. Then you'll know the truth and that truth will lead you to freedom. Pray that for your grandkids. Pray that for your kids, that they would know the truth because they live obedient lives to the Lord. And this directly leads to number three. Here's number three in the prayer. That they would bear much fruit. Pray that your family, that your grandkids, that your kids would bear much fruit. This is the second part of verse 10. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you'll grow as you learn to know God better and better. You see, God produces His fruit on earth in and through us by His Holy Spirit. This is an important uh, thing for us to understand. You are not capable of living a fruit-filled life apart from your connection and knowing and faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we're connected to Him by His Spirit in us, Galatians 5, 22 through 23, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in us our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. There's no law against these things. How many of you want to see your grandkids and your kids living peace-filled, love-filled, patient, kind, good life? This is our desire. Well, this is called fruit. Fruit is something that comes in our life when we are connected to the source. John 15, 4 through 8, Jesus says, remain in me and I'll remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. You cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I'm the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me, now listen to this, and my word, my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples, and this brings great glory to my Father. See, the only way Jesus says that you and I can be fruitful is if we are connected to the source. Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. Do you want to see your kids and your grandkids live fruitful lives? Then you can pray all you want. But if they're not connected to Jesus, friends, it's impossible. That's why our first prayer for our family is not about their behavior. It's Jesus that they would know you that they would be connected to you because it's radical the difference this makes, friends. I've seen parents who pray and pray and pray and pray and the behavior never changes. And then that child is connected to Jesus. Poof, fruit. It's amazing what God can do. Isn't fruitfulness what our desire is for our kids? Isn't that what you want? Do you want to see your kids and your grandkids, your family members, live fruit-filled lives? And I just love, listen to how, first, uh, listen to how Colossians 1.10 that we're reading. Right after this it says about being fruitful and it says all the while. That's the next words, all the while. What's that mean? It means that as we are living this fruitful life, we are also constantly growing in our knowledge and in our faith, becoming better and better in our relationship with Jesus. Isn't that beautiful that while we're being fruitful over here, also at the same time, we're growing. We're growing. We're becoming, uh, our, our, our expanse is reaching. If you think of it as a fruit tree, the fruit is on the tree, but the tree is still growing. The roots are expanding. The canopy is getting larger. Philippians 1, 9 through 10 says, I pray that your love for each other will overflow more and more, and that you'll keep on growing in your knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until Christ returns. More and more. Isn't that what you want? Don't you want that for yourself, for your family, for your kids? Then let's pray it. Let's pray that they would be fruitful. Let's pray they would grow more and more. Let's not get stuck. Let's not get stagnant, right? Jesus desires for us to grow. Individually, as a church, we are a people who believe that all healthy things are growing. And it's important that you don't stop growing in your spiritual life. You all desperately, we all desperately need more and more of what Christ is doing in our lives. Number four, pray that they would be strengthened with all power. Pray that they would be strengthened with all power. Colossians 1.11, we also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so that you will have all the patience and endurance you need May you be filled with joy. See, believers need to be empowered if we're going to live this life for God. J Jesus knew this. He knew this was true about us. And so when he gave us his great commission, he said, but don't go and do any of this yet. Right? He's like, go Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, but don't go yet. Because you need to wait to be empowered. You need to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. For believers, we are people who are reliant daily 
And I pray that you'll pray this for your kids and grandkids. That they become reliant daily on the power of God. 2 Peter 1, 3-4. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. So, uh, just stop. Do you want your kids to have everything they need for living a godly life? That happens by His divine power. Going on, we have received all of this by coming to know Him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he's given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. See, Peter is telling us very clearly in a time of enormous persecution where the the church was a, a tiny, 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 tiny little minority of culture and they were under constant oppression. He was saying, listen, the only way we can do this is by God's divine power. We all need Christ's power to live the lives we're called to. You can not discover God's dream for your life and live it out by living in your own strength and your own power. 2 Timothy 1.7 God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. See, the power that believers need in our lives is a gift that comes from being a person who is a vehicle of the Holy Spirit. It's the Spirit's power in us. It's not my inner power. No, no. It's God's power living in me in the person of the Holy Spirit. So let me ask you a question. This is a real one. Look around the world right now. Turn your news on right now. Look out your front yard right now and tell me, do you think your kids and grandkids are going to need to be empowered by the Lord if they're going to live fruit-filled lives in 2023 in our country? Can they do this by their own strength? Can they do this by their own power? Will they be able to push against the movement of our culture by their own strength? No, no way. But with God's power, everything is different. You know, when Paul famously says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, what he's not saying is I can do whatever I want because I got God's power. What he is saying is, if it is the Lord's will and his desire, there's nothing that this world has that can stand against me because who's in me is much, much more powerful than who's in this world. And friends, that's the reality that we are living today. Do you want to see your kids live lives? Do you want to live a life? that it pushes against this flow of our culture and our world, then in order for that to be possible, you've got to be filled constantly with the power of God. Verse 11 says, We also pray that you will be strengthened with His glorious power so that you will have all the patience and endurance you need. May you be filled with joy. Patience and and endurance that you're going to need. How many of you have found yourself in this cultural season we're living in feeling like you've run out of patience and endurance? According to Paul, the patience and endurance we need comes as we are strengthened by His glorious power. See, Jesus guaranteed to us this is how it was going to go. I think sometimes we can get caught up in the false uh, theology of, of the word of faith movement where we actually begin to believe that once we become Christians, life should get a lot easier. But Jesus said, actually, in this world, you're going to have trouble. There's going to be problems for you in this world. In fact, think about Jesus. He had a lot of faith, right? He's pretty perfect. He had a lot of faith. And how did his life turn out? Well, I mean, it turned out pretty great. He's on the throne. But I, to get there, he was crucified on a cross. He was tormented and beaten. He was mocked openly. He was stripped naked. Okay, so he was a man of faith, but he still had trouble. And he says, if I had trouble in this world, take heart, because you're going to have trouble too. See, if we're going to live in this world where there is trouble, 
Listen, guys, I'm, your grandkids and your kids are going to have trouble in their life. Your family's going to face trouble. So the, the goal of our life is not just to escape trouble. Because you can live a perfect life and still run into trouble. So the reality of this life is not that we would just escape trouble, is that we would be empowered by the Spirit so that in the midst of trouble, we have the knowledge of God's will and we can live our lives for God despite the trouble, in the midst of the trouble. You see, God never promised us an easy life. Some of you, friends, I'm not trying to play this down. Some of you, your family is in real trouble right now. Your kids, your grandkids, they're just in real trouble. I'm not trying to minimize that. I understand. I'm trying to give you tools so as you pray for them, we're praying for them in a way that I believe will really ultimately get to the root, the source of the problem. If your family's going to overcome the trouble they're in, they're going to need God's power. They're going to need God's power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's living by God's power. Maybe we need to read that like ten times. Because here's what I found. It's easy to make it about a lot of talk. But the kingdom of God isn't a bunch of talk. It's living by God's power. So pray that your family would be strengthened. Pray that they wouldn't rely on their own strength. Pray that they would give up, surrender to doing things by their own power and their own will, and that they would come to the place in their life where they can truly say to the Lord, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. I need your power for this situation and circumstance. And the good news is, it's available. It's available to help you. Number five, the last point. Pray that they will joyfully give thanks to God. It's the last part of verse 11 and verse 12. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. You see, joyful thanksgiving is the life attitude the byproduct of men and women who are living intimate, fruit-filled, spirit-empowered lives. You see, sometimes we can be trapped again like our world into thinking that our gratitude is just the spontaneous eruption of emotion that happens when everything in life is going really well. It's easy to worship God when you win the lottery. Thank you, Lord! Right? It's easy to worship God when the check comes in. It's easy to worship God on the day where you're experiencing the fullness and the bounty of the blessings of God in your life. But, friends, gratitude is not reserved for just those moments. Gratitude is a discipline that we desperately need to learn. It's something that you make yourself do that then bends your life into the right direction. You see, discipline, and remember what the Bible says, don't discipline seems pleasant at the time. Discipline saves us from being a human ping pong ball that's batted around by our emotions and our urges and our circumstances and our desires and our culture. We say, nope, not going there. Nope, I'm going to be disciplined and in the midst of this challenge, I'm going to worship the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 18. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful in all circumstances. What he's telling them, Paul is saying, don't make the mistake of reserving thankfulness and gratitude for when you feel like it. For when everything is just right. 
And here's the secret to it. The secret to it is if you look back at the last part of verse 12, he says, he has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people. What he's saying is, how can we give thanks in all circumstances? How is that possible? It's possible when you and I remember that we have been adopted by God, that we are part of God's family, that there's nothing that can change that. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God. For He chose us in advance and He makes everything work out according to His plan. God's purpose was that we Jews, who were the first to trust in Christ, would bring praise and glory to God. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom He promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us the inheritance He promised and that He has purchased us to be His own people. He did this so that we will praise and glorify Him. Band, you can come back up. I want... I want us to pray these things for our family, for our kids and for our grandkids. I want us to use this as a roadmap because I just believe if you were to pray this way for your family, that it would really, really be impactful.